Well, good morning. Welcome to Freedom this morning. We're so excited that you took a moment uh, here to be with us. We hope you grab a seat, grab your coffee, grab your children wherever they are running, bring them over to, together and join us online. I'm here with my wife, Pastor Alicia and Caleb, uh, behind the scenes, playing it beautifully. I taught them so well. Well done out there, Caleb. No, that's not true. But uh, I'm so excited that you have taken the time to join us. I want to take a moment and extend the greeting to you. Uh, I know that they could have been a hundred churches you probably could have uh, logged on to this morning, but you chose to be here with us, and I'm so glad that that's the case. And before we go into the worship and the word and, and the opening this morning, I'll say one last thing before we go into that. Is this whole thing uh, has been difficult for a lot of people, the transition, the, the, um, you know, the situational um, physical locations and all this has been tricky. But we ask you to do something. Those of you that are part of the house, freedom, I'm talking to you, consider making giving a continual part of what it is that we're doing here. Um, let me tell you something. I got to brag about Freedom for a moment. Freedom has been on top of it. We have been having amazing uh, giving that way, uh, considering that we haven't been in our building for a couple of months now, right? We have not really missed the beat too much. Now, of course, giving is down in difficulty, but we also understand that there are people that are saying, that's my church. And I want to continue to sow seed in it. And I want to continue so that when we meet again, there's no needs that are beyond the house. So let's take care of the house. Let's take care of all of our missionaries that Caleb can attest to this. We haven't, sing, we haven't dropped a single missionary through this whole thing. It'd be very easy to go, you know what, let's cut our, let's cut our, you know, put some savings in there. Let's be careful where we spend our money. Yes, we're being careful how we spend our money. But guess what? We haven't cut a single missionary organization. We support 13 missionaries and organizations around the world. And we're going to look to pick up more. This pandemic, this issue is not going to stop us. We're going to continue to give uh, two missions. Um, so we will uh, work toward that. And we will continue to do that. So we're working on the sound right now. We, we understand that there's some people that maybe can't hear too well. Uh, we're going to work on that right now, make sure that everybody can hear us well. And so that's what I'm hearing. The volume seems low. We're going to get that. The volume is low because my wife was singing and I'm just talking. So I'll let the audience decide that. I'm not going to decide that. But I will say this. I will say that... Um, you know, your giving is an important, important, integral part of our ministry moving forward and all of our missionaries and things that we do in outreach. So, yeah. And so there are three ways to give. And so tell us real quickly, Lisha, how we can give um, to the Lord and so see. There are three different ways for you to go ahead and give. Um, so you can give by mailing your, your physical check to the church, and the church address is 3114 State Route 405 in Milton, PA 17847. Or you can go online to wearefreedomlife.com and click online giving, and you can set it up that way. Or you can do text to give, and the text to give number is 84321. There you go. And and you can text the, the number amount you want to give to that number, and then you can set it up, put your information in, and then any time after that, all you have to do is just text an amount, and it's just a very simple way to give. All right. So we're going to move on to Pastor Corey. He's going to open us up with a scripture and prayer, and then we're going to dive right into some time of worship this morning. All right, good morning, uh, Freedom Family. I have an opening scripture for you. We're going to be reading out of Romans 12, 1, 2. Uh, so it starts off by saying, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. <clears throat> so basically it's saying, give yourself over to God. You know, this is not always easy as it means a disruption of your regular pattern of life. Mm, doesn't that sound like the world today? But it goes on in verse 2. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Why? So you can see what God is doing and what God is up to during this time. And not let what you see in front of you right now, what's going on in your life right now, what's going on in the world right now to control your life. And as you offer your body 
as a living sacrifice, as it says in verse one, then we'll be able to recognize God's will for us more and more. And then we'll be able to live in our dreams and what God has for us instead of living in our fears. So as we go into worship in the, in the word this morning, I just want to pray over you guys that we'll be able to see past what is going on in the world today, to see past your current circumstances, to, to see past your current situations and see beyond what God has for you, your plan and your future and your dreams for your life. And so, Father God, I just lift everybody up right now that's that's tuning in, God, everybody that is going to be tuning in later on, God, that you will be able to be able to to fill them up, God, to see past what's going on in their life. Anything that's going on in their life, Lord, I just ask that you speak peace. Speak peace right now in the middle of everything that's going on, God, so that they'll be able to see your good and faithful through this, God. So, Lord, we just uh, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to you, God, so that we'll be able to live with you in our dreams so that we can see what you have for us during this time. This is our time. God, this is your time. In Jesus' name. So let's just take some time to prepare our hearts. God, we love you. Lord, worship is for you. It's about you. It belongs to you. Give me clean hands. So that I can come to you, Lord, in this time of worship, Lord, not inhibited by anything, no thoughts, no worries, no anxiety, God, but worship, Lord, to you because you alone are worthy of it. You deserve the highest praise, God. We worship you, Lord, today. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's all we need. It's just you, it's just you, Lord. It's all we need. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just worship the Lord in your own way. Maybe you're at home just sitting there and just soaking in his presence. Maybe your hands are raised in complete submission to Jesus. Maybe you're waving your hands in praise. Maybe you're on your knees crying out. Maybe you're laying on your face before him saying, God, I need you more. Do you know that there's no wrong way to worship? He just asks that you give him your all. So, Lord, empty us of ourselves as we just dive into your presence and ask for more of you. Thank you, Jesus.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever see Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you, yes. And holy, oh, there is no one like you. Oh, there is none beside you. We open up my eyes in wonder and And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. No, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Oh, been my song this week, you know? I'm not a person that is very good at being still <laughs> and not um, do, keeping busy. And I'm busy, but it's a different kind of busy. Um, and it's so easy to get caught up in the negative parts of what's happening around us right now so, so easy. 
But the minute that we start singing about the goodness of God and we start declaring the things that he has done and his righteousness and just the blessings of God, your mindset changes, your perspective changes, and your atmosphere and your home will change when you start talking about the goodness of God instead of the negative impact of the news and the corruption and the, um, the fear and the frustration. Man, it's so easy to dwell on that right now, isn't it? But what happens if we dwell on the goodness of God? And so this week, this song has just ministered to me. It's one of my favorite songs. We've, we've never done it at church. Um, but I messaged Kayla. I'm like, hey, can you play that song? Because I really feel like this is, this is the song for us right now. So I pray. If you know this song, worship along. If not, just, just soak it in and think of the good things of God. Think of the things that he's brought you out of. Think of the things. There's so many blessings. If you have air in your lungs this morning, right there's your blessing from God. If you have vision right now, there's your blessing from God. If you have use of your hands and your mouth, there's a blessing from God. Come on, if your ears can hear, there's a blessing from God. God, you've been so, so good to us. You're faithful, Lord. Lord, let us sing of your goodness all the days of our life. Keep our eyes set on you, Jesus, your promises, Lord, who you are, your goodness, your character, God. May we think and reflect on
I will sing of the goodness of God. We've been lucky enough to find ourselves in a position where the goodness of God doesn't ever run out. The goodness and the grace of God doesn't run out. Lord, for everyone at the sound of my voice right now, listening to this live stream or rebroadcast, or maybe you're up late right now and you don't know what to turn to and this feed popped up. This is the moment it popped up. I speak to you in the name of Jesus that God would release you from the struggle that you're dealing with right now, the struggle that's keeping you up at night, the struggle that's keeping you bound by the lies, bound by the enemy. In the name of Jesus, we speak life into your mortal body. And Lord God, as Pastor Corey read earlier, may we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What a good word. To be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Father, this entire series, we've been talking about being empowered. Father, we're not going to sit back on our heels. We're going to tip forward in our, in our, on our toes and say, God, do something. Do something. Do something here. In the name of Jesus. We're thankful that you're faithful in the small things and you're faithful in the large things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you so much for the wonderful team you've blessed this church with that are working hard to, uh, to see the goodness of God even through this pandemic. We refuse to sit back. We want to fight. We want to be uh, right in the front of what you're doing and bring people to Jesus at all costs. In the name that is above every name, we pray. The name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. What a good, good start to this morning's worship experience. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Caleb. What a beautiful, beautiful setup uh, to, the, to the Word of God this morning. I want to dive in for just a few moments. Can I do that? I want to dive in for just a few moments and talk to you about what it is that's on my heart. If you've ever played baseball or like me, if you've ever taught a sport of any kind. For me, I loved that I got the opportunity when my little boys were uh, young. They got to play t-ball. They got to uh, play a little coach pitch. But one of my favorite parts is when they were little, little, little. Um, while I was teaching them how to stand, how to hold the bat, sometimes they hold it, you know, the other way around, and they're looking. I'm like, no, you can't. You got to put switch the hands, stand this way, and kind of walking them through the process. And it was a learning process because no matter what I said, like 30 seconds later, they're completely off again and they're just kind of off to the side. No, no, put the hands here, put the hands there. Right, Joe, you remember that? You remember uh, there are times, that, you know, it'd be like that. And okay, no, stand now, no, tilt your head now. Now swing and now lead with your hips and fast bat, fast bat, you know, and then teaching them all these different things. Keep your eye on the ball and um, among some other things. You see, if you have a coach that taught you these things, you realize that uh, when you step to the plate, they're, they're giving you coaching tips. They're giving you things. They're telling you, hey, there's a guy on first. They're telling the guy on first, hey, there's a, if there's a play, you gotta, if it goes here, if it's in the air, you got to be careful. There's always that constant tutoring, that constant teaching. The coach guided you, trained you, he showed you. Well, the truth is that we need the same thing in our daily lives. Every single one of us need that constant training to keep our eye on the ball. Listen, this morning's message is entitled, I was made for this. I was made for this. And I'm going to get to what that means in just a moment because I, I know that 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 7 tells us that we should be training ourselves for godliness. It says, uh, he adds that while Paul is speaking rather to the young Timothy, and he says this, while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Right? Physical training has its value, but there's something about having a, uh, a spiritual training, a spiritual training that gives us value in every way. It's important that we acknowledge that godliness Godliness is huge 
and the, and the following of Jesus. It's important that we acknowledge that godliness is rooted, and watch this now, listen, faithfulness. Godliness is rooted in faithfulness. Now listen, faithfulness radically opens up the kingdom of God for all of us. I want you to write that down. I want you to tweet that. I want you to update your status, whatever, when you get a chance. Write this down, memorize it, get it in your head. Faithfulness radically opens up the kingdom to each and every one of us. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a story we're going to get to in just a moment. This is the story of Esther. Faithfulness is at its root. Now, watch this. Faithfulness is the, is the crux of many storylines. I know my family, my wife and I especially, we're trying to get our kids to understand it a little more. They're not quite jumping on what I think they will eventually. The Lord of the Rings. I like the Lord of the Rings. I like the series. I like what it teaches. I like the fact that there's a faithful Samwise Genji. So I'm going to know what I'm talking about. Samwise was a faithful one, wasn't he? He stuck with Frodo. He was there through the difficult times. There's Samwise. I ain't no dropping no Eve, sir. Right? I just, he's, he's doing whatever he has to do to protect his Frodo. That's his buddy. That's his lifelong pal. And that, that friendship that Samwise Gamgee had in that entire trilogy was amazing to me. Or maybe it's the story of your grandparents, a love story, a lifelong love story that they had. We, you know, grandparents that were, uh, that were in love since they were in their, you know, teen years. You know, there's stories that move the heart. In such a way that you're like, wow, that's just loyalty and faithfulness right there. Well, Romans 15 tells us this. Give us, it gives us some insight. It says this. For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience, nobody wants to hear that P word, right? That patience. Don't ever pray for patience, a lot of people say, right? Don't pray for patience because you'll be stuck in traffic and, and you'll learn, right? But that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hope. Scripture has story upon story of the faithfulness of God's people and the faithfulness of God. The unfaithfulness of man versus the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God's people and God saying, you know what? Everybody else was unfaithful. Well, you were faithful. Or rather, everybody else was unfaithful. You were faithful. Watch me bless you. And that's, that's where I'm coming from this morning. Whether you are faithful or whether you're unfaithful, I'm speaking to you this morning. When I'm talking about faithful, I'm talking about faithful to God and your faith. Today I want to talk about Esther for a moment because it fills me with intrigue as we look at the human nature. How frail is human nature sometimes, right? We, something happens, all of a sudden we get, we get shook. But listen, church, God isn't shook at this time. Listen to me. God is not shook by any pandemic. God isn't shook by anything that's in your life. Everything. Don't ever waste a single moment. Everything you've ever been through and everything you're going through, God will bring you through it. See, your, your job is not to just go, go through it. Your job is to grow through it. That's our job, to grow through it. So we look at the story of Esther. If you would turn to the book of Esther for a moment. I talked about how this message is entitled, I was made for this, and that's, this is where it comes from in the text here. We'll read in just a moment. The idea is, is, is more along the line of, um, for such a time as this is more uh, quotable. But I thought to myself, what is a statement that we need to remind ourselves every week? You know what we need to remind ourselves of? I was made for this I was made for this so let me uh, let me ask you to turn if you were to Esther chapter 7 we'll get there in just a moment so as you turn to Esther 7 we understand something about the story for those of you that have never followed or you don't really typically read your Bible very often or you just kind of new to the faith um, Esther is a very interesting book because 
It's one of the few books in the Bible that have it's such a, such a story driven, such a story driven content. The story is amazing from beginning to end. And so we look in the book of Esther and we see some unfaithful conspirators plotting to kill the king. The king was unfaithful to Queen Vashanti, uh, Vashti rather, and uh, selfish, selfishly he banished her and replaced her by the winner of this next beauty pageant. And the winner of this beauty pageant was none other than Hadassah, who was later named Esther. Then we have Haman. Haman is the book's bad guy, right? He's the bad guy in the book. He's the epitome, the per personification of evil. The embodiment, wanting to kill the Jews, right? So we find out that um, this Jew named Mordecai, right, doesn't bow down to Haman. Haman is, is well-respected, a powerful man in the kingdom. Out comes Haman and everybody bows down. But Mordecai, watch this, Mordecai did not bow down and Haman got all prideful. He got upset. He's like, I deserve better. You should be bowing down before me. Now, Haman isn't even king. He's uh, close to the king and he wanted to get even closer because he loves pride. He loves power. But Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. And that's kind of where we come to here because at somewhere between that, that point and chapter 7, several things happen. And throughout that, we find out that Mordecai had warned that the king was about to be killed. And so he passes along and they find out that this, this plot was true. They, 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 they eliminate the threat. And Haman is invited to sit with Esther. Esther finds out that Haman wants to kill all of the Jews, wants to take out and wipe out all of the Jews because of one guy. Watch this. One guy, and he wants to take out all of the Jews. Mordecai finds out. He tells Esther, you need to, you need to go before the king. You need to tell the king. Mordecai says, do something, Esther. Do something. You know, she says, I won't allow this to happen. Maybe I was brought in this hour to do this very thing now listen closely Esther understood her role and you know what she said I'm gonna go before the king now there's one rule one rule with the king and here it is are you ready unless you're summoned you don't come before me or it is instant death death penalty to anyone that comes before the king without asking his permission or being summoned right you have to be given permission Esther finds out about this plot to kill all the Jews, including Mordecai, and would include her if they found out who she was by decree, right? Mordecai prays. He gets his people to pray. Esther and her friends, they pray. She goes before the king, and she says, King, I need to come before you. The king says, I will let this one go. I'm not going to allow the death penalty. What's on your heart? Meet with me tomorrow. So they meet. And she meets with them, and Haman is invited. Haman's excited. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm important. So they meet together, and in, in this odd thing, she says, I want us to meet again tomorrow. I want us to meet again. So then she calls him to meet again, and watch this now. This is where it picks up. I wanted to lead the story to this point, because now Esther has set up Haman. And right before they meet again, the king says to Haman in a conversation, what should we do for the man that has saved the king? And Haman says, so prideful, it must be me. He says it to himself, it must be me. So I would say you should parade him, <clears throat> me, parade him across the street. Let him be uh, held with high honor. Let him, let him have a robe of the king and let him be, because he thought it was him. He thought he was the one that was going to be honored. So he spoke as, this is what I want for me. But little did Haman know that that was going to be the very man he hated. So the king then calls for this to happen. Haman throws a hissy fit. And he says, we're going to wipe out all the Jews. And then at the dinner where Haman, Esther, 
and the king are seated. The king says, what's going on? What, why are you? What's going on, Esther? My queen, what is this that you need? Half the kingdom, up to half the kingdom, tell me what it is that I can do to make you feel better. And she says, king, there's something going wrong. And this is what we pick up. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1. So the king, and I'm going to read this, and I want you to follow with me. Esther, chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, this is the second meeting, this is where we pick up. The king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? What is it that's on your heart, right? What is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. L listen, let me stop for a moment. She doesn't say, I just want you to fix this. She says, save my life. And he's like, wait, what? You're, you're being threatened, right? For I and my people have been sold, uh, for if, rather, for I and my people have have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, it would, I would have kept quiet. But because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. So then all of a sudden, the king asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Who's your threat? Look at me. I want you, everyone looking at me right now. If you're, if you're sitting in your living room, if you're sitting in, in wherever it is, and you're looking up at the screen for a moment, I want to ask you, Quentin, who's your threat? Who's your threat? Because God is your fighter. He will fight for you. Who's your threat? What is your threat right now? Is it fear? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? Is it doubt in yourself? Is it your financial status? What is your threat? What is the thing that's threatening you? Because let me tell you something right now. My king is fighting for you. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for you. And the truth is, he will not let up. So watch this. The, the king Xerxes says to the queen, who is he? Where is he? Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is this vile Haman. Haman's sitting at the table like, uh, what? What are you talking about? Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king got up in a rage. He left his wine and went out to the palace garden. But Haman, he didn't chase him. He started petitioning to Queen Esther. And he gets there and he goes, and he starts realizing that the king had already decided his fate. And he stayed behind to beg Queen Esther. Watch this. Verse 7. Beg Queen Esther for his life. Here's the man that was so bold, so proud. Now all of a sudden he's begging. He's begging for his life. And as he's begging for his life, the king returns from the garden to the banquet hall and Haman is falling on the couch where Esther was reclining and he looks at Haman and he thinks the worst the king exclaimed will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house will will he go after the queen will he go and try to put moves on my lady come on that's what he's saying he's going after my queen right I, I'm not I'm still in the building what is going on? And at that very moment, as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, attended the king and said, A pole reaching the height of 50 cubits stand by Haman's house. It's over 70 feet, if my math is correct. Very, very, this thing was, now listen, I want you to, remi I want you to be reminded, this thing was outside of, Mo of Haman's house. Why? Because he had it built. For Mordecai and all of the Jews. The very thing that the enemy was going to use against God's people is the very thing God uses against the enemy. Does this sound familiar? David and Goliath. David went up against Goliath and the very sword that Goliath was going to try to slay David with, that's the very thing he used. So what am I talking about? He went out and they, and the Bible tells us that the king had him impaled on the very same execution piece of equipment that he was going to use against 
the man that was faithful to the word of God. Let me tell you something. The faithfulness of Esther saved an entire generation, maybe even more, entire race. He was going after the entire race, all the Jews. And it would have included her if she was outed. In this book, we find a couple key points. And in this storyline, we find a couple key points. If you're writing down things down, write this down. Number one, the faithfulness of God to his people is noteworthy here. The faithfulness of God to his people. By the time the story progresses to chapter 7 where I just read, you see the faithfulness of God through this whole thing. As Esther took every step, she did it carefully. As Esther stood and she took every step, she found that to be so imperative that praying and creating a God strategy. Listen, Esther didn't go into the king's quarters without a strategy. She developed a God strategy before she went into the king's quarters. There's a lot of people that go before God and not even developing a God strategy. What am I going to give to him? Not just so much what is God going to give me. Because a lot of people approach prayer like this. Oh, I have a need. Let me take that need and let me just transfer it to God. No, you know what? I have a need. But here's what I want to do. I don't just want to have a need. I want to give something to God and say, listen, God, I value you. Now look, here's my need. What am I saying? Before I ask God of anything, I'm going to worship him. Before I ask God for anything, I'm going to be faithful with the little so he can give me charge over much. Before I do anything about asking God to save my relatives, save my friends, guess what? I'm going to save other people's relatives. I'm going to save other people's friends. Not save them, you get what I'm saying. But I'm going to reach out to them and I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Do you want God to save your spouse? Do you want God to save your family? Do you want God to save your coworker? You know what? Then why don't you start helping somebody else with theirs? And watch how God will bless you. In other words, I'm not coming to him empty-handed. There's great power in faithfulness. So what am I saying? Is that required? No, but I know for one thing, there's times God has done things for me. I never brought an offering. That's just the grace of God. But I'm also not going to abuse the grace of God. I'm also not going to look at that situation and go, you know what? That's not for me. But listen. The only thing that could derail Esther's plan is, watch this, Esther. <laughs> because she had her faith in the Lord, her God. Faithfulness is being true to one's words, beliefs, and promises. Number two, because there are times that we're, we're, we, have, we struggle with our faith. Stay true to your beliefs, friends. Trust in the Lord's promises. Keep waiting on him, and that's exactly what Esther did. Number two, God's faithfulness unleashes God's power. Look at what God did. With Esther and Mordecai. First, God provides justice. When Haman's plot was exposed, it led to, to, to taking this situation and eliminating the threat. God provided protection in giving the Jews the ability to protect and defend themselves through, through Esther's uh, quick rise to the king's favor. God provided joy and gladness. If you read the end of chapter 8, you'll see how the people of God were blessed because of this. Listen, indirectly, Haman didn't realize he was blessing God's people with his, with his strategy. His strategy was to wipe people out. Guess what he was doing? He was setting God's people up to be blessed by God. So what am I talking about? As you worship God in any way you worship God today, whether it's loving your neighbor, giving, serving, worshiping, praying, however you're loving God today, do so with joy and gladness and knowing that he is with you. Amen? I mean, no, God is faithful. You realize God is faithful? God is faithful. The faithfulness uh, that still unleashes that power to you and me today. Friends, let me tell you, you are empowered by faithfulness. He is no genie in the bottle granting at your request. He is your God that sees the big plan. I'm trusting that today you will unleash the power of God by faithfulness. So here's my third point. My third point is we see God's faithfulness release because of his faithfulness to us. I don't know about you, but I think about how faithful God has been to me 
And that makes me want to be all the more faithful to him. Esther and Mordecai, they were not in a situation that was comfortable for any Jew. They were being ruled by this king. And they lived in, in a, as fourth and fifth generation exiles in Persia. They were living in a land that was unfamiliar, not like their faith at all. And they, as they lived in this pagan land, Esther didn't even have godly parents that we know about, right? And her story reveals that, that Mordecai was, the, was that father figure in her life. And I want to tell you something. She regularly articulated a sense of dependency on God and her faith. What are you leaning on today? Are you leaning on your faith or are you leaning on what you know? Fact. Are you leaning on your faith? Listen. Esther, the book of Esther is interesting because it's one of the few books that really don't mention God. It's kind of like God is in the, in the background as a, as a faithful shadow overseeing his people. My understanding, if I remember correctly from my Bible school days, the two books in the Bible that don't mention God. One, the Song of Songs or Songs of Solomon and Esther. Now, there's references to God indirectly. But there's that shadowing of God in the midst of things. Why? Because I believe God wanted to bring balance to everyone. And we look at the Songs of Solomon, we look at that book, and we go, why wouldn't God? You know, let me tell you something. God is in the marriage setup. Without being mentioned, he's in the marriage setup. And in this book, Esther, God is in the shadows as a faithful Lord and faithful God. So what's the big idea here today? So let me tell you what that is. The faith you have is the grace gift from God. Listen, the faith you have is a grace gift from God. I want that to sit in for a moment because the same faith he gave you to save you from hell and judgment is the faith he nurtures and grows you with. The very same faith. Through that prayer time, through the quiet times. Listen, when you're sitting with God, praying, I believe that there's a great thing that happens. Now listen closely. God has been amazingly faithful to you, whether you realize it or not. Friend, look at me for a moment. Even if you're, just sit, you're sitting in your living room right now, just sit up for a moment and hear what I'm about to tell you. Hear me. The faithfulness of God isn't always viewable from our present point of view. Sometimes we have to look back and go, where is God in this? And ask yourself, what couldn't I do by myself? You do that long enough and you'll see God in it. God has been faithful and he's never taken his eyes off of you. Let me close with this thought for a moment. For those of you that are at home, I know I've sat on my couch and I love watching these makeover shows. One of the ones that my wife and I love to watch that um, we don't necessarily watch it anymore, but we love watching them. Any sort of makeover show, right? Sometimes it's extreme makeover, whether it's a house. That's great. I love watching how they make over a house for a family and bless a family, right? But what I really love to watch is personal makeovers. When somebody has gone on there and they've lost 50, 60, 100 pounds, and you look at them and you go, wow, they, they're so, they look so beautiful now and they, they feel so good about themselves and their, their life has been given back to them. And, you know, it could a tear jerker kind of said, don't, don't, don't admit it. I get it. That's fine. You don't want to admit it. You got a little tear kind of coming out. You're like, no, nah, it's just an onion I cut up a little while ago. It's just affecting me kind of, you know, whatever. But the truth is, it, gets, it tugs at your heart where you say, wow, that person got their life back. That person sees their life again. They see hope. They see a promise that they didn't see before. You see, we love those shows because it shows that anything could happen. And that's my thought to you today. I want to tell you that the, the, the hard truth is this. All of these shows rest on one thing, willpower. The willingness to be faithful to a task, to see it through to the end. And what did Esther say? When Mordecai came to her and said, there's a plot to kill me 
and everyone you know back home and you because every Jew is on the target at this point. You know what she said? Maybe I've been brought for such a time as this. I'm going to go before the king. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Now pray for me. And when I go, I'm going to go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. Friend, that's the attitude we need to have right now. I'm going to go before the king. I'm going to grab hold of this situation. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to stare this thing down and go, I'm going to be everything God wants me to be. I'm not going to fear or run anymore. But why? Because I was made for this. I was made for this. Yet even when you're in a season of life that doesn't seem to make sense, I was made for this. Whenever you realize that, that, that the faithfulness that you had was lacking, you know what? Stand up and say, I was made for this. Keep trusting, keep obeying. And there are many of you that have trusted God through this difficult time. Grace and peace to you. And for those of you that struggled, that's a lot of us too. Just because you fight through it doesn't mean you haven't struggled. Can I tell you something right now? His faithfulness is a strength in a time when nobody else can give you that. I can draw strength from my bride, my wife. But there's a strength that comes from God that only he can give. I'm going to do something, and I really, really feel led to do this. I'm going to ask Caleb to come back up again and my wife to come back up again. And I want us to do that, that song that we just um, that we just sang earlier. And I was just going to close in prayer, but I, I hope you stick around for a few moments. And let's sing this song again together. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about, that last song, I believe, that you guys just sang. Can I entertain you right now? Maybe you're in your living room. And here's my challenge to you. Ready? I don't want you to just maybe log off or do something. I want to pray. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to consider maybe even standing up in your living room right now. I want you to declare this in your life. I want you to take a moment and say, you know what? The goodness of God is coming after me. He's coming after me. Man, when you started singing that, Leisha, it just started, I'm just standing there like, wow, you've been so good to me. Can I encourage you? I know that you've been through some things lately. I know that you're struggling, and I'm not asking you to deny it. I'm asking you to face it. You've been going through some things. I get it. But you can choose to look at that, or you can look toward the promise and the goodness of God and choose today to worship God in such a way that you would say, your goodness is coming after. Come on, right where you're at. I'm going to ask you if, you, if you want to and you're, you're willing to do this, you'll be like, well, then my family, we don't typically stand here in my living room and worship. Maybe you should start. Maybe you should start. Maybe this is your moment. Can I challenge you right now in your living room, right now and wherever it is you find yourself, stand up right to your feet right now and let's do this together. Let's sing this song together. And I know the words are not up on a fancy screen and stuff. We don't have that for you, but, but just follow along. And if you need to just listen to the words, listen to the words and let it speak volumes to you. And so, Father, I pray right now, every person at the sound of my voice, let them see that you are sustaining them and you're working behind the scenes. And that you are faithful to your word. You are faithful. And your promises are yes and amen. You are a good God. You are a good God. So good. And your mercy.
Oh, I'm going to see of the goodness of God. God, we thank you that you are so good. You are so good. And Lord, for all the people that are in circumstances when they open their eyes, and look, it doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good. Lord, I ask for your goodness to come. I ask for the truth, the reality, and the experience of your goodness in our homes, our lives, and our families. You are good, God, and your love endures forever. You are good, God, and your love endures forever. And we will see your goodness in the land of the living, not just in our dreams, our thoughts. Lord, we thank you that we will see your goodness in the land of the living because you are faithful. You are faithful to your people. You are faithful to your word. You're faithful to your promises, God. And I bless everyone watching, God. Let your faithfulness be seen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, I hope and pray that today you have been blessed. I pray that you go forward this week in his faithfulness and in his goodness and share with others what God is doing in your life. Maybe text someone today what God is doing in your life. Let them know that you are there for them and that you will walk them through their journey too. So God, we thank you for this day. And I ask, Lord, that you would just continue just to pour out your blessings on your people. And God, we just, we love you. And uh, I just pray, God, that you would bless all these people out there that tuned in today. Lord, that they will experience you in such a rich new way today. Amen. Amen. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week.